This is an actual spacecraft from another world, piloted by alien intelligence. One sighting from tens of thousands made over the last 50 years on virtually every continent on the globe. Intelligent life from distant galaxies is now attempting to make open contact with the human race. And tonight, we'll show you the evidence. We celebrate the new Tomorrowland in Walt Disney World in Florida with a television special that's out of this world. Hello, I'm Michael Eisner, head of the Walt Disney Company. In a top secret military installation somewhere in the United States, there are those who believe that the government is hiding the remains of an alien spacecraft that mysteriously crashed to Earth. With more and more scientific evidence of alien encounters and UFO sightings, the idea of creatures from another planet might not be as far-fetched as we once thought. In fact, one of you out there could have the next alien encounter. Enjoy tonight's special. I'm gonna walk over and see if I can sneak a peek. Maybe not. Alien Encounters from New Tomorrowland is brought to you by Bounty. Outstanding absorbency and durability make Bounty the quilted quicker picker-upper. Scientific verification of extraterrestrial life forms routinely arriving on Earth. Top secret reports from ongoing military investigations. Compelling home videos of alien craft captured within the last few months. World figures who have gone public with their own extraterrestrial experiences. The shocking history of government misinformation programs designed to prevent widespread panic and personal accounts of those who have been abducted and studied against their will. It's happened to me, it's happened to my sister, and I believe my mother. My son looks me straight in the eyes, and he says, they took blood out of you, Mama. They don't ask permission, they take you. But it's such an incredible secret, nobody wants to believe it. There is valuable scientific data that would prove once and for all that planet Earth is being visited by highly evolved intelligence that is not from this world. Wait a minute. I've had enough. Stop it. From beyond the boundaries of our perceptions, intelligent beings are beckoning mankind to join the galactic community. It's an invitation which is both wondrous and terrifying. This is the nature of alien encounters. Mankind has the unique ability to ignore the obvious, especially when the facts reveal a disturbing truth. We once believed the sun revolved around the Earth. When Galileo demonstrated the reverse is true in 1634, he was charged with heresy and placed under house arrest for the last eight years of his life. The charges were later dropped, 342 years later. Now as we approach a new millennium, Mankind is in the midst of the most profound event in history, actual contact with intelligent life from other planets. For nearly 50 years, officials have been documenting routine alien encounters here on Earth. And thousands of people have seen or experienced this alien presence. Yet many others still refuse to acknowledge the obvious evidence all around them. What is it like to be confronted by a creature whose intelligence and skill is far beyond the comprehension of mankind? Would it be enlightening? Would it be an exercise in terror? Or perhaps both? Here in the new Tomorrowland at the Walt Disney World Resort near Orlando, Florida, these concepts are brought to life as guests experience their own alien encounter, a sensory thriller from Disney and George Lucas. We'll give you a sneak preview later in the show. 
But first, we must prepare you for the future with some shocking insights from the recent past. Alien ships seem to arrive in waves. And if the last few years are any indication, planet Earth is experiencing a tsunami of sightings. Mexico City, 1992. If you were arriving from outer space, this would be your first stop. It's the world's largest metropolitan area, easy to spot from a distance. Saucers arriving here have an affinity for military helicopters. This one was caught stalking a squadron during a national holiday celebration. Dozens of people videotaped the craft. Millions more just stared in disbelief as it covered 200 square miles of territory in a matter of minutes. Canada, 1991. In a residential area just outside Ottawa, this alien ship was photographed landing in what appears to be a prearranged site. UFO investigators claim the structure of this craft reveals a technology previously undocumented. This sighting is known as the Guardian case, named after the pseudonym of the photographer who wishes to keep his identity secret to avoid harassment from local authorities uncomfortable with the notion of alien intruders. For the last few months of 1994 and lately in 1995, Gulf Breeze, Florida has been ground zero for alien encounters. Especially during the day, extraterrestrial craft have become common ornaments in the uneasy skies. Over those dunes, right there. There she is, right there. Oh my God. Residents of Gulf Breeze routinely aim their home video cameras at the horizon. More often than not, they capture an astounding alien display. There it is. There it is. Right out there. So it looks like an egg on top, an egg on the bottom. You would think these alien sightings would be front page news. So why have they received almost no national attention? The answer is simple. For governments determined to maintain their authority, extraterrestrial contact is pure dynamite. They're beings from another planet. We don't know where they come from. We don't know what they're doing here. There's nothing we can do about it. Meet Captain Kevin Randall, retired Air Force intelligence officer, now a top investigator of alien encounters. Anytime a technologically superior civilization comes in contact with a technologically inferior civilization, the technologically inferior civilization ceases to exist. Not necessarily through conquest, not necessarily through invasion, but because the technology changes the underlying social structures of that civilization and it uh, disintegrates. Those fears are reflected in a 1960 federally funded study by the Brookings Institution, which warned that public knowledge of alien life could cause civilization to collapse. So they began a policy of covering up and hiding the information, but they also began a policy of ridiculing, so that people who really see something are afraid to come forward. This isn't right to do the ridicule. I mean, a lot of people suffer. Retired Army officer Clifford Stone certainly suffered after he began private research into the UFO phenomena while still in the service. Well, I was given a lawful order while I was in the military to back off. I refused that lawful order. That resulted in me having to go to be psychoanalyzed, which kind of backfired on my command. But I was actually given a lawful order not to write to members of Congress without first getting an approved through my command and not to uh, talk to members of the media. Of course, I went out and violated all those directives simply because I felt they had no right, that I had a right. He also has determination. This collection of classified government documents represents years of determined effort by Stone to open the UFO files and offer fresh leads to investigators on the trail of the truth. It is not surprising that this book is making top military officials very uncomfortable. I think that some of the underlying concerns they have is the impact it will have on society as a whole if the information is ever released. And why have aliens chosen to visit our small blue planet? 
hidden on the distant fringes of an insignificant star cluster? Well, we invited them here. When we return, what is attracting alien visitors to planet Earth? Extraterrestrials take aim on America's military. A crashed saucer becomes a top-secret bombshell. The nation's capital becomes a cosmic crossroads. And later, how Disney Imagineers have designed a way to prepare humans for their inevitable alien encounter. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a fire enfolding itself, and the brightness was about it. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. Ezekiel chapter 1. There have been reports of alien encounters throughout recorded history, often buried in the obscure poetry of mystics. But since the end of World War II, alien encounters have adopted a darker, more menacing demeanor. No longer just spirited lights dancing in the sky, UFOs turn more brazen, announcing themselves with surprising ferocity. Most alien activity on Earth in this century seems to have been sparked by the single most profound technological achievement in human history. The atomic bomb did more than blow away every conventional notion of combat. It also saddled mankind with the awesome responsibility of life and death for the entire planet. But what the world didn't know in 1945 was that the atomic bomb's brilliant burst of energy would also be mankind's cosmic calling card, announcing to the universe that a technological society had evolved on a small blue planet in the backwaters of the stars. So as the world celebrated the war's end in 1945, aliens who heard man's atomic trumpet we're already charting their course towards Earth, responding to our open invitation. As early as 1947, the large alien ships began to arrive, navigated by living creatures. Their advanced physics allowed them to transverse the galaxy and pierce Earth's atmosphere with amazing speed. The U.S. military immediately went on the alert against the unknown menace. Sightings were perceived as threats to the security of an America still reeling from the edgy consciousness of war. And the sightings were taking place all across the country. I glanced up and there were three flying saucers in a V with uh, what appeared to be a dome on the top with, I can't be sure, but I believe I saw the sun glinting off of uh, our windows or observation portals of sort. I think it was from outer space, but friendly. Army fighter planes are on patrol for flying saucers. Cameras installed to photograph them. Portland, Oregon, the area from which came the first weird reports. This flying saucer patrol shows how the Air Forces, while not putting too much stock in the mysterious things in the sky, are investigating. The control tower is in touch and on the watch. So are a whole lot of people these days. They're seeing flying saucers everywhere. Lots of fantastic discs flying through the air. But the military finally had to admit that something was happening that they didn't understand, offering their first and only public statement on the UFO phenomenon. The recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. They weren't always called flying saucers. Some reports claimed they resembled other household objects. The public was fascinated and anxious to make contact. But our official response remained aggressive, sometimes sparking deadly games of high-speed, high-altitude cat and mouse. National Guard Captain Thomas Mantell played that game and quickly became a grisly statistic. His last words, as Mantell soared at an altitude of 20,000 feet, 
are a chilling commentary on the power of the alien ships. I'm closing in to take a look. It looks metallic and of tremendous size. It's going up now as fast as I am. That's 360 miles per hour. I'm going after it. Moments later, Captain Mantell's mission had ended. Occasionally, the tables were turned. More than one alien craft crashed and was recovered for secret U.S. military research. The most famous case took place in July of 1947, just outside the community of Roswell, New Mexico. Famous because local officials openly admitted they had retrieved an alien ship before their commanders instructed them to keep the story confidential. What you can't explain, they reasoned, you must deny. July of 1947, the Army Air Forces at Roswell announced we had captured a flying saucer. You can say our government announced in July of 1947 they had a flying saucer. Three hours later, they announced, no, no, it's really a weather balloon. The officers at Roswell made a mistake. But our government has come forward and said, yes, we had a flying saucer. Then they take, took it back. Any one of your viewers can go back to the newspapers on July 8th, July 9th, 1947, and just front page headline after headline that the government had captured a flying saucer. Determined Don Schmidt from the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago is convinced that the Roswell case is the linchpin in America's ongoing alien cover-up. We have over 550 witnesses. They were there. They handled the debris. They saw the craft. They saw the bodies. They handled the crew members of that craft. And invariably, they all say, this was not from this Earth. This is the actual site where the Roswell saucer was discovered, along with the bodies of three extraterrestrial missionaries who didn't survive the collision. The debris and the dead were impounded and taken away for top secret study. While a classified investigative committee called the Majestic 12 was organized by President Truman. And a government cover-up was initiated with a calculated disinformation campaign. The military, I know for a fact, has established what's called disinformation programs, officially sanctioned deception programs. This is covered by a regulation at Department of Defense level that's secret. This is the case with the unidentified flying objects. I cannot say that the Roswell incident was a cover-up, but I can certainly say that the government back then and today acted like it was a cover-up and has been subject to being accused of a cover-up. The flying saucer debris at Roswell was attributed to a down weather balloon. There was no explanation for the alien body parts among the wreckage. Before long, other sightings were dismissed as optical illusions caused by electrified swamp gas, with elaborate demonstrations staged for newsreel cameras to back up the claim. But while the Pentagon refused to publicly admit aliens had arrived on Earth, their top secret internal memos told a different story, even detailing the various ships and the creatures they had autopsied. Meanwhile, the American people fell in love with flying saucers, sensing something playful in their alien design. Before long, even the military seemed to fall under the trance of the UFOs. Government inventors began to mimic what they were seeing in the sky, in a strategy to stumble upon the secrets of advanced alien technology. These rare films chronicle those primitive efforts. At a symposium conducted by Princeton University, weird and wonderful flying machines developed for the Army go through their paces. The flying scooter, for instance, with only a seven horsepower motor. Or this flying, what have you, just count your fingers after starting the fans. The naive attempts to copy the saucers began to look foolish, especially in July of 1952, when real alien ships were routinely buzzing over Washington, D.C., leading fighter pilots on frustrated chases lasting as long as six hours. It was the first time since the War of 1812 that our nation's capital had been successfully invaded by a foreign power. By the early 1960s, UFOs were having a chilling effect on our defense operations. Their tremendous speed often caused them to be misidentified as incoming intercontinental ballistic missiles, 
putting American air bases on red alert. There needed to be some way for the U.S. and the Soviets to distinguish between nuclear attack and alien visitors. A weapon is installed in the Pentagon, but it's a weapon of peace. This is the teletype that will operate at the U.S. end of an open line to Moscow. This link, it is hoped, will help avoid misunderstandings that could possibly trigger a catastrophe. Now a president could be in touch with the Russian premier in a matter of seconds. The plot line between Moscow and Washington was set up so they could go ahead and make last minute pleas that uh, we're not attacking you and you're not attacking us. The purpose for this was to ensure that a nuclear war would not be touched off by a UFO appearing on the scopes and being mistaken for en enemy aircraft. The hotline eased some international tensions, but it didn't halt the interaction between the military and the aliens, which continues to this day. November of 1975, essentially every SAC base in the United States was visited by UFOs. We have reason to believe that the UFOs went ahead and uh, had some effect on changing the codes, the, the codes within the missiles, within the launch control uh, facility, to change where the missiles would hit. 1976, September, Iran. Two F-4s tried to intercept a UFO and shoot on a, uh, shoot up on the UFO. The weapon systems of the planes go dead. The uh, communication systems go dead. These are just two examples of cases which sound like they came out of science fiction, but in reality, they're from government documentation, documents released by the State Department. The main engines up and burning. September 1991. Space Shuttle Mission 48. Commander Clayton and his crew point their cameras at the planet's horizon for a live broadcast to Earth. Many viewers noticed an alien ship playfully cavorting around the shuttle at tremendous speeds. NASA still refuses to acknowledge the incident. But since that time, the space agency no longer allows public access to live unscrambled television signals from shuttle missions. Currently in 1995, the Federal Emergency Management Agency trains personnel with a manual that suggests techniques in communicating with extraterrestrials encountered in the line of duty. This document is in marked contrast to a federal law passed by Congress in 1969, which makes it illegal for any American to have contact with an extraterrestrial, punishable by a $5,000 fine and a year in jail. Ironically, both documents were composed by a government which refuses to publicly admit that there is intelligent life on other planets. Indications are that government, military, and scientific leaders will soon release nearly a half century of official documentation of ongoing alien encounters on Earth. Perhaps they feel it would be too embarrassing not to reveal the truth before the truth reveals itself. But these FBI files acquired through the Freedom of Information Act outline nearly 50 years of UFO reports investigated by federal agents all across America. Overwhelming evidence that something sinister is at work. But look carefully. The torn pages, the ragged copies, the large areas blacked out in an effort to keep secrets locked away. If we are keeping information, which I am certain we are from the American public, on unidentified flying objects, then we're wrong. Government has an obligation to the people to tell the truth. No matter what that truth might be, the people have a right to know that planet Earth is being visited by a highly evolved intelligence that is not from this, from this world. When we return, meet the people who have already experienced disturbing contact with creatures from another world. They don't ask permission, they take you. See how government is monitoring mutant life forms which have already staked their claim on planet Earth. And join Robert Urich on the fringes of the future in Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom as Disney Imagineers prepare the public for their inevitable alien encounter. from New Tomorrowland.
The fact is, everyone encounters alien life forms each day. We've just become accustomed to ignoring the evidence. We expect the first visitors from outer space to arrive in flying saucers. But there are new scientific suggestions that the microbiotic organisms, which routinely invade human bodies in the form of viral disease, may have extraterrestrial connections. These minute alien life forms may very well be the advanced invasion force, leading the way to test Earth's environment for more complex and determined creatures. The idea is not new. Arrhenius, a Swedish chemist who died in 1927, first proposed the theory of transfermia, the notion that life is universally dispersed, possibly carried by cosmic winds across the vast expanse of the galaxy in the form of viral spores. Uncovering this mutating alien life is an ongoing government project carried out by scientific teams at NASA. They begin by collecting meteors which have landed on the barren landscape of Antarctica. Here, low temperatures preserve the alien life clinging to four billion year old cosmic debris. In a specially sealed clean room at the Johnson Space Center, these crude interstellar spaceships are carefully dissected to extract the biotic matter inside. Amino acids, a kaleidoscope of organic compounds, and the chemical catalysts of life are analyzed with sophisticated gas chromographs and mass spectrometers. Life is plentiful in the universe and eerily tenacious. Lately, scientists have found extraordinary numbers of unknown organisms which have gained a biological foothold where we once thought survival would be impossible. They grow in deadly ammonia gas. They are resistant to ultraviolet radiation. They thrive inside the radioactive cooling systems of nuclear power plants. And they can even survive the vacuum of space, reanimating themselves when air and water become available. Riding inside the stone cocoon of a meteor, life can travel virtually anywhere, and a good deal of it lands on planet Earth. But just as we explore the genetic package of alien life, visitors from space are routinely examining human specimens, abducting men, women, and children in order to conduct disturbing biological experiments. Very, very few people who've had the experience are willing to talk about it publicly. Uh, there is such a kind of ridicule factor. Bud Hopkins, researcher and author of the best-selling book, Intruders, is America's leading investigator into the alien abduction phenomenon and largely responsible for bringing the astonishing situation to the nation's attention. The most important thing about this, I think, uh, in studying it is to realize that there are very distinct patterns. This is not just a, a box full of crazy experiences which are mutually contradictory. Uh, the patterns start this way. People are abducted first in childhood. When I go back into my memory, I don't know a day without them. And they are then re-abducted uh, over many, many, many years. When I saw this light on the freeway, my first reaction was, oh my God, not again. I grabbed the side of my bed like, no, you're not going to, you're not going to get away with this. this you know, you're not going to get away with it this time. Then I feel lifted off of the bed, and the next thing that I remember is being on a table or a bench and these beings surrounding me. Samples are taken from the skin. There are very distinct scars that result from uh, these uh, biopsies, whatever we want to call them. I have a scar on my hand. It seems to be a triangle shape that's a half an inch, half an inch by half an inch, if you were to measure it. They're just red and blistery and kind of in a tr large equilateral triangle on each foot. The basic, uh, most common mark is what we call a scoop mark. It's a circular depression, uh, as if the aliens have used a little tool and removed a layer of cells. On my upper left inner thigh, I have two marks. There's a series of two. They're about an eighth of an inch deep and about a quarter inch in diameter that people call, call scoop marks for lack of a better term. Often uh, an object is inserted in the nostril or behind the eyeball or in the ear, which we believe to be implants. On my shin between my ankle and my knee were two puncture marks. In fact, they, I hesitate to call them that because they were larger and deeper. They were like two holes 
drilled vertically along my shin into my leg. And that frightened me deeply because I, I have no idea how those got there. You know, I could only speculate as to why they were doing that. Although, although I do know that you know bone marrow contains genetic material. I mean blood. They're interested in who you are genetically. They seem to be desperate for our genetic material, our DNA, our particular genetic makeup, as if they have reached some point of, let's say, some point of no return in their evolutionary development, and they need to revivify themselves through something they can get from us, a more primitive and perhaps more robust uh, species. People generally describe one particular type of figure uh, as the basic alien type, which is a small figure, three and a half to four and a half feet tall, huge head, huge black eyes, uh, hairless, grayish white skin, uh, just a tiny slit for a mouth that doesn't move and so forth. Uh, I'd say that accounts for about 85% of the uh, descriptions. There are some that are very, um, they, t they talk about um, the reptilian being like sexually aggressive and then there's some that look like praying mantis that are very mean and uh, very uh, violent. It is a violation of your body, it's a violation of your space. They don't ask permission, they take you. On this earth, when you are raped, when you are mugged, even if you don't see that person that is doing you bodily harm, you have somewhere to go. You can go to the police and at least give a report whether they do something or not. You have somewhere to go. But in this case, you have no one to talk to. You have no one to say, this has happened to me, I've been so violated, you don't even know and you're not ready for this. My love life went to hell. <laughs> my, my schooling went to hell. Everything went to hell. And it's terrifying. It's not fun. It ruins your life because you have nowhere to go. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky. Makes me want to cry. Part of the trauma involved in this is our government telling us that these objects don't exist. And I seem, and other members of my family, and other people seem to have these experiences. It... You, it makes you doubt your sanity. The range of people who have had abductions around the world, because it is a global phenomenon, uh, is just, it's a total range. Uh, I've worked with people who are of Oriental backgrounds, African American background, Hispanics. I've worked with one NASA scientist, a research scientist, who is an abductee, uh, a police lieutenant from the South, doctors, lawyers. I mean, I've had, incidentally, seven psychiatrists come to me because of their own personal abduction experiences. The phenomenon affects people from, from all walks of life. And it has a dramatic effect on families. Debbie and Terry know firsthand. Both are ongoing abductees with deep concerns about the chilling connections between aliens and their children. I thought this was mental illness. Then my son started speaking about little airmen coming into his room and taking us up. And there was even one point where he said, they took blood out of you, mama. He wanted guarding all the time. He uh, wouldn't go to bed at night unless I slept with him. He was uh, angry. And the other thing was, is he started setting traps. One night my husband came home from work and there's these little colored stones all over the garage. And Dale, my husband said, what is this for? And he says, well, this is when the airmen come, they slip and fall on their butts. The interesting thing about children is uh, a sort of innocence about their perceptions. I, I will present these cards of different heads, and, I'll, and there's Santa Claus, Batman, um, uh, policeman, a clown, uh, Ninja Turtle, an alien. 
what we do is to see how the child responds when we get to the alien face. Um, and it can be extremely moving because I've seen children just collapse when they see the drawing of the alien crying, hugging their fathers uh, or their mothers in terror. Well, she was four years old and she was past bedwetting and, and all of that behavior. She was beyond that and she never wet her bed. And when we moved to Banning, she started having nightmares every night and wetting her bed. And a couple of weeks ago, she had a bunch of scratches on her face and she didn't have them when she went to bed. I said, what happened? And, and it was funny. The only thing I could get out of her was that she asked me, do aliens hurt you? And I went, what? And a woman told me, for instance, that uh, her little girl, when she was first able to talk, uh, would tell her about these nightmares of what she called uh, the bugs coming in the room. And they were big bugs with big eyes. And again, there were some physical marks, all the uh, uh, surrounding evidence suggesting abductions. At one point, the mother, a few years later, was getting out of the car with her daughter at a shopping mall, and the Goodyear blimp was coming over and the little child said mommy look don't you remember when you and I were up in that thing with the bugs the last time I had a session um, in that session I actually saw Lexi being escorted by two small grays and it was very upsetting to me I could not handle the fact that my daughter was being subjected to something that I had no control over and when I think you have no control over something that you're so helpless, it's like your child's crazy. drowning or something yeah. and you can't save them. I feel like I'm going to go crazy because there isn't anything I could, could do for my son. I know. One of the most interesting things, too, from a child's point of view, uh, has to do with the fact that communication is telepathic. One little boy drew on some, uh, some drawings he'd made for me of the aliens. He put on the side of the head, each alien head, a gigantic ear, just one. And his mother said, what's that? And he said, well, uh, Mommy, I know they don't have ears, but I put that there because, you know, they can hear everything you're thinking. When we return, Robert Urich takes you to the new Tomorrowland in Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, where Disney Imagineers are creating extra terror, estrial excitement, preparing the public for cosmic contact with a virtual alien encounter. This is an official UFO sighting report, one of thousands compiled over the last few decades. This particular report from October 1969 was filled out by Jimmy Carter. He was still governor of Georgia at the time. He witnessed a luminant object suspended in a twilight sky. Later, when he assumed the office of president of the United States, his staff attempted to explore the availability of official investigations into alien contact. As this internal government memo illustrates, there are some security secrets outside the jurisdiction of the White House. We investigated lights in the sky for over 20 years. We didn't get anywhere. We have over 100,000 cases from over 160 countries in our files at the Center for UFO Studies in Chicago. When you actually take the time to look at the official record, look at the actual declassified, disclosed documents on the phenomena, and I'll guarantee you'll walk away saying, why weren't we told about this? And why were we told something else altogether? We've all been indoctrinated to have this knee-jerk response just to that term, UFO. We have to ask ourselves, who started it? And isn't it about time we go out and find out for ourselves? Every year, NASA routinely propels about two dozen astronauts into a low Earth orbit aboard the space shuttle. A loud, lumbering, somewhat primitive rocket ship. But most Americans will likely explore outer space aboard crafts of alien origin. 
Statistics indicate a greater probability that you will experience extraterrestrial contact in the next five years than the chances that you will win a state lottery. But how do you prepare for such an extraordinary event? Here in the new Tomorrowland at Disney World, scientists and Disney engineers have brought to life a possible scenario that helps acclimate the public to their inevitable alien encounter. Welcome to the new Tomorrowland Convention Center in the Magic Kingdom, where humans can enjoy their first taste of the future, as well as advanced extraterrestrial technology, and begin to understand the disturbing facets of alien intelligence. Access Technologies, an interplanetary manufacturing and marketing conglomerate, is one of the first alien firms to take advantage of this showcase facility in new Tomorrowland introducing humans to technology which promises to seize the future. Today, guests are exploring the concept of teleportation, the ability to transmit solid matter or living creatures across the endless void of space. Inside this chamber, at the extraterrestrial alien encounter attraction, cosmic representatives will demonstrate the secrets of a brave new world. Utilizing the ominous device, two very different life forms will make contact via the teleportation process. Unfortunately, high technology can backfire if operated by careless hands. As the seat restraints lock into place and the power generators are activated by anxious extraterrestrials, these happy humans are about to discover a disturbing truth. When science fiction becomes science fact, the results could be terrifying. at Walt Disney World Summer 1995. Planet Earth has always been a laboratory for alien life forms which can drop in from space or slowly mutate into bizarre fleshy organisms at our feet. Understanding the nature of these strange creatures from above and below is the greatest challenge of our age. We now know that our future, indeed the future of Earth itself, rest in the balance of the solid and the ethereal, of common sense and the irrational, in our relationship with alien life as grotesque as a fungus or as glorious as the heavens.